Hi. Wow. Um, thanks for having me and uh, for coming to the circus um, to listen to me. Um, this session is about, although it says poesis, it's in there too, but it's actually more about androgyny, and that happened this week, and I couldn't change the title anymore, but that's still in there too. Um, it's about androgyny, or the in-between, um, and how that is relevant for the way we work, talk, and play. Um, obviously, the in-between is related to the transition that we're in, um, that we've been talking about for days now, um, but the in-between is also interesting in terms of us, because we are in between the feminine and the masculine. And I think there's um, something very profound um, when we consider not, the, not men and women as <laughs> the opponents uh, or the, the couple that dances, but if we talk about feminine and masculine. And uh, those little labels that I gave you, uh, I'd love for you to um, take one side and write down um, on a scale from 1 to 100%, where do you think you are in terms of your masculine and your feminine? So, for example, for me, Ela, I would be 60% feminine and 40% masculine. How do you do that? Just like 30 seconds, should be a quick thing. Right, maybe can I ask, does anyone find that difficult or is that an intuitive like, yep, sure? It's easy, nice. Okay, so um, there's a little mind game for the rest of the session. Turn around your little label and write down the opposite of you. So if, you're, if I'm a woman and I am 60% feminine, 40% masculine, now I would be a man and I'm 60% uh, feminine, 40% masculine. And my name is Sven just to have a name. Give yourself a name so you have a proper alter ego and try to put yourself in the shoes of that person and listen from that perspective. Um, all right, so um, I've always been very androgynous in the way that I showed up in the world. Uh, and when I moved to Australia, I was confronted with a whole new gender system because men and women are very, very far at the end of the spectrum there. Um, and for the first time, I really experienced what it means to hit against a glass ceiling um, because I'm a woman. Um, when I started working with uh, two guys called Future Crunch, they're amazing. They're talking about um, future technologies and um, how we can use them or how they are, um, uh, how, how they are an optimistic um, view for the future. And I um, do collaboration design with them. So we sometimes have a talk and then I do um, the interaction afterwards. Um, and they <laughs> were complaining to me that they can't find any female futurists. And I was like, what? <laughs> awesome. Um, and they were like, yeah, but you're not that into tech. I mean, it's like, oh, it's like, okay, you're trying to make a female futurist into a male futurist in a woman's body. Because there is a, there is a difference. There is like something profoundly feminine about empathy and the way we interact as humans. And there's a futurist who works with empathy and behavior and humans and studies that, and I'm working with you, and I'm giving people experiences, and that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> you are working with a female um, futurist. Um, so from that, um, everything unraveled very quickly, um, and allow me a binary to make up a binary about the masculine and the feminine, although we all know it's uh, more fuzzy than that, and I actually want to make that point about fuzzy, um, but it's easier to make a point when you're talking about binaries, so... Um, I need my little, uh, I've prepared something because I couldn't be, nah, no, I didn't, I don't like slides, but I've prepared this. So I want to talk about symbols, um, language, storytelling, and poesis. Um, so there's a pyramid here, and um, the pyramid is the old structure of the 20th century or pff, centuries before that. Um, it's a hierarchy, it's a control mechanism, it's command and conquer. Um, it's scarcity, it's about the what. Um, Dave Gray talks about um, the organization, the corporation of today um, as a pyramid too. Um, and I would say that is um, a very masculine structure. It's very fixated, it's very based on dominance. And then we have a galaxy, that's why I have these here. Um, <laughs> and we have these little things that are floating around 
It could be satellites, planets, comets, um, starships, and they all have a relationship to each other. And this is sort of like the spiral movement, maybe in design thinking you would call that an iteration, um, in which they go through time and space. Um, and it's way more similar to the way that we see peer production functioning or the commons functioning. But it's also important to see that these relationships constantly change. There is no point of fixture. And that is also much more similar to life. Um, so when we see this, I would now argue in my binary that that is a way more feminine way um, of doing things because you have to surrender to the flow. You have to surrender um, and be responsive to the things that come to you from the outside at any given point in time. When you're trying to plan ahead too far, you get off course, like there will be <laughs> comets hitting you left and right. Um, so that may be, um, as a starter, uh, about symbols. And if we put that back into our body, I think the masculine in our work life is boss of our feminine. Because we try, with design thinking, for example, it's such a surge at the moment, uh, we try to bring a different way of thinking and doing and bringing the customer in into corporations. Um, but then something happens. The masculine gets boss, that becomes boss of design thinking. And all of a sudden, design thinking is married with business modeling and agile and lean and all these things that are number oriented um, and where control mechanisms um, are being put in place again, taking out the heart of what the galaxy um, lives by, and, and that, is, that is organic. Um, so when we um, talk about design thinking and language, to make my next point, um, after the war in Germany, the Second World War, Horkheimer, Adorno, Habermas, they all called for a new language, um, because by using the old language, they, with Einstein, um, also uh, argued that you can't um, uh, solve the old problems that created um, that problem, the language that created the problem. Um, I think we're um, stuck in that same situation. Um, when we talk about design thinking in the way that we do today, we talk about strategies and tactics. Um, we talk about a war room, um, and that is all very belligerent. Uh, it's very competitive language. Uh, it's, again, very far on the masculine end uh, of things. And when we talk about, when, when we are in conversation and we talk about a maybe that is perceived as weak, although I would argue that a maybe in a conversation is not weak, a maybe is an opening up, a maybe is not, I'm making an argument that is so freaking strong that you can't counter me, that is divisive, and that is again competitive, I win. When you say maybe, you open up the space and you leave a gap for someone to step in and say, I know something, I can help you, we can do this together. And that's where I was like, Daniel Pinchbeck. Um, that's where the ego needs to surrender and resolve into the collective. And I think our own neoliberal residue of wanting and needing to get ahead and being completely paralyzed by the fear-mongering media um, we're exposed to constantly, it takes a lot of gut um, to just say, like, this this is a suggestion, I don't need to argue this with you, um, and I can also let go of this suggestion. Um, from that, uh, I would like to move on to how we tell ourselves stories um, and how um, we tell stories to other people. Um, Douglas Rushkoff, um, in 2007 or so, he had a wonderful talk at DIY Days, and he explained the Hollywood story structure um, by foreplay, rising action, climax, and sleep, <laughs> which I thought was really <laughs> adequate. Um, and that is a hero's journey. Um, a heroine's journey would look very differently. There would be multiple orgasms, and they would be in all different places in your body, and they would occur at once or staggered. Um, and <laughs> Uh, and also, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and also, there is um, a different structure to a feminine story. We don't shoot an arrow um, 
to reach a goal um, like a masculine person would do. Um, we read our environment and we look at what's necessary at any given point in time. We have fuzzy goals. We have like an idea that there is something, but it's not necessarily a desire that is like directed at an object. It's more <laughs> comes from a place of love, and it's just like omnidirectional, kind of. I'm getting really all out here. This is brave. <laughs> um, so I believe that the heroine's journey is actually way more related, again, um, to what we see um, in the internet and technology. It's decentralized, it's going everywhere, and it's reacting to whatever happens with an idea um, of what lies ahead. Um, but not a goal that has to be achieved, or a dragon that has to be slain. Um, moving from that um, to poesis. Um, poesis is a word from philosophy, and um, it means creating something in your life, either materialistically, biologically, sp or spiritually, and something that comes from deep inside you and something that is larger than yourself, something that you can leave behind afterwards. That can be children, that can be a legacy. Um, and that is a very intrinsic motivation um, to do things. Um, and I don't think there's much, uh, probably most people here in the room agree with me, there's not much room in society today to do that, although more and more people step up, look at themselves, learn what their skills, passions, and um, ideas are and um, bring themselves into um, the arena with that. Um, but then again, we're forced to brand ourselves as something that is very focused because when we remix a million things, no one hires you because they don't understand what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> um, so what is... Wh how can we not brand ourselves in this way that we make up a glossy cover image for ourselves that doesn't have anything to do with who we... It has a little bit to do with who we really are, but there's again this, like, there's this smooth surface and no one can step in. Whereas if you're just giving people the things that you're interested in and you're proving your skills and you have a network of people that recommend you, uh, might be way more real, way, more, way better for your mental health um, than creating that website and making it even more flashy and focusing yourself on that one thing that you're giving to um, society and all the other things have to happen in the shadow. Um, and I think they're an integration and there again is the in-between between work and life. Not to say that that is necessarily a good idea, but um, if we do that, I think there's no way around authenticity and acknowledging that we're all many. Um, and <laughs> we're all the things. We're all the, I am all the things. Um, <laughs> awesome. So, um, what do I want to leave with you with? Um, because I don't have slides that you can take photos of. Um, but I put this on my blog. It's very um, unpretentious. It's very random. Um, it's eliansen.com. Um, so, in, the, in, in, my, in my journey, from um, being really in the closet with my creativity to standing here with a little bow tie and uh, that thing on, and doing little performances, um, um, I've learned that I needed to embrace the chaos and let it guide me, and to really be in my own flow um, by acknowledging others around me and respecting their boundaries and to only taking my freedom as far as their freedom comes towards me. Um, I needed to resist labeling things and wanting to find a name for it and having that urge of controlling and fixating things and accepting that things are just fuzzy and that it's okay and that I don't need a, a definition for everything. Um, I needed to let go of control of a lot of things and um, really just accept that life is not linear, my path is not linear, things are multi-layered, multi-linear and they always cross a different path and it's magical when they do because you haven't expected this but the universe sort of gave you this gift right now and you're just like yay um, and then um, all that comes with integrating paradoxes because if we want to integrate the masculine and the feminine to be androgynous um, in our work in our life in our person um, 
then we have to accept that the future is only rational in hindsight. Um, so also, since I have been um, on this journey um, to be my truest self to the world, I have um, woken up at night with stuff coming out of my brain, and I would like to close my talk with a very short poem that came out a while ago. We look at our naked bodies, lying next to each other. You look like me in a man's body. Your femininity is mine. My masculinity is yours. It seems so obvious. Our arms are made to hold and guide. Our hands strong to build and tender to care. We are saloon, the androgynous unity. I behold you until I learn to give your talents as much as mine, until you master my talents as well as yours. Until then, we harmonize our beings to match our souls. Saloon. Thank you. <laughs>